sure. and we are live. Excellent. So um, now that we're live, we're going to give a few people, uh, we're going to give people a few moments to um, log on, to, to join the session. Sure. We'll have a little bit of a, a run up to the actual talk itself. Um, so for those of you um, who are watching the YouTube recording, welcome to what is the seventh ENSO seminar. Um, our speaker this month will be Dr. Joel Parthamore. Um, I'll introduce Joel more fully just before the actual um, presentation of the talk begins. If you are an early riser um, or an early arriver, there is an invitation link available on the Google Hangouts event page for the talk. And that invitation link, if you use that to, um, so I think if you back out of this talk and um, use the, the invitation link posted beneath um, the main event on the event page, you'll be able to join the, con the, the conversation live. Um, and so that what that means is during the, the questions and answers session, you will uh, we'll be able to speak with each other and, and you'll be able to interact with Joel. Um, with Aside from the uh, invitation to the live link, questions can, as usual, be asked using the Q&A app within the Google Hangouts on Air system. So if, um, if the app isn't active for you, if you uh, look up to the top right of the video window, there's a small um, apps icon, sort of four square boxes together. You click on that, the Q&A app should be a, a small blue speech bubble with Q&A in it. And if you click on that app, then you should have a column in the right-hand side of your screen, which will allow you to ask questions and to see questions that have been asked and, and build them up. Um, so those are the, the, the technical details. Um, we have um, one or two viewers. And we'll give people just another minute or two more, I think, before uh, we get started with the full content of the talk. Um, so that will uh, give people an opportunity to settle in, make sure their coffee's warm, and prepare us. OK, so. Um, Welcome, Fred. Hey, Joel. Don't know if you can hear me. Yep. 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 You cool. fine? Yeah, brilliant. Um, great stuff. These instructions just took a long time to figure out how to do that. Okay. <laughs> uh, we'll have to. We'll. We'll. This is now we've sort of properly. Oh, you know, we, we might consider this a sort of a, a fuller beta test of the the uh, live participant format. So uh, we can probably um, develop clearer instructions and uh, figure out where to post, where is best to post the link, and so on. Mm. Um, when it works, it's sweet. Yeah. Cool. Um, OK, so what do we got? We're coming up on um, five past the hour. I'll give them maybe people maybe one more minute, and then we'll kick off. How many viewers can be live? Um, live up to 10 people in uh, sort of in the session, including the chair and speaker, so eight um, audience members, as it were. And unlimited spectators. And an unlimited number of spectators. Right. So we get we get some sort of strange. It's the ever the the nature with statistics from the internet. Um, they're they're never entirely reliable. We get these sort of. Um, information pages and, and um, status updates from Google as to how many people viewed and at what time and so on. And um, they, they sort of they vary pretty substantially um, over the course of just you know even just a few minutes. Mm. So um, I'm not sure how robots are counted or ignored or so on. Um, okay, so I don't want to delay too long. Um, so as we uh, continue on, I guess we'll. Um, push ahead, and as more viewers join, they will they'll be able to uh, jump in live or view the recording. The seventh ENSO seminar will be delivered by Dr. Uh, Joel Parthamore. Joel is currently in the Department of Cognitive Neuroscience and Philosophy at the University of uh, Hövde. Um, if, and my apologies to all Swedish speakers for the pronunciation. Um, prior to that, Joel was at the Center for Cognitive Semiotics at the Department of Languages and Literature at the University of Lund, also in Sweden. 
and um, his uh, doctoral research was conducted um, partly there and partly um, primarily at the University of Sussex, uh, the, the, the um, Centre for Cognitive Sciences. I think the centre went through a, a series of identity changes during the period that you were there, Joel. So. Um, if not outright identity crisis, yes. <laughs> so um, Joel's uh, areas of interest include the likes of um, artificial consciousness, um, psychological well-being, and non-standard approaches to psychological well-being and disorder. Um, you're fresh out of a, a symposium in which you were talking about um, human sexuality and robotics. And sex bots, yes. Sex bots. Um, very popular session, I'm sure. And uh, but your uh, perhaps your area of your home turf, as it were, your area of um, key interest is in um, concepts and um, the the sort of the philosophy of concepts and categories and the role of concepts in 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 mind and the philosophy of mind more generally. Conceptual frameworks, conceptual change. Yep. Okay. So and it's precisely on that that you'll be speaking today. So. Um, without further ado, um, Joel, I would invite you to um, begin the talk on consciousness, conceptual agency, and the unbinding problem. Sure. Uh, just let me try turning on the screen share here. One second. Okay. There we are. So, um, the unbinding problem and phenomenal unity of consciousness, turning the binding problem on its head. I just, uh, because of the format of this talk, I can only hit a few key points. I want to talk at least briefly about my interest in consciousness studies in general. Um, most of my research has indeed involved uh, working on theories of concepts and the nature of conceptual agency. Um, at the same time, I've repeatedly made the claim in my papers that conceptual agency and consciousness are really two sides of a single coin, namely that we tend to attribute consciousness just in those cases where we attribute conceptual agency and vice versa. We attribute conceptual agency just in those cases when we attribute uh, consciousness. Uh, this, I believe, further is implicitly assumed by many, if not most, theories of consciousness other than those that are really strongly reductionist or uh, eliminativist. I've done two oral presentations at the annual conference formerly known as Toward a Science of Consciousness. It's now, if somewhat... Uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, arrogantly called the science of consciousness this year rather than toward a science of consciousness. Uh, so um, uh, when it was in Stockholm a few years ago, I gave a talk on the knowable limits of human cognition and how that impacts our study of consciousness, uh, what that uh, rules out, I think, and what it rules in, what opportunities it gives us. Uh, and then uh, this past summer when the Toward a Science of Consciousness conference was in Helsinki, uh, I gave a talk on a novel uh, defense for uh, a libertarian, uh, incompatibilist, and non-determinist account of free will. Uh, I have two articles in the Journal of Machine Consciousness as first author, uh, both of those with Blay Whitby. Uh, and those, uh, both of those address the nature of moral agency in humans and other persons, including potential artifactual persons. Uh, in relation to both uh, cognition broadly and consciousness in particular. When it comes to consciousness studies, there are a number of common assumptions that I take to be largely, if not entirely mistaken, uh, first of all, that any one or another theory or approach can provide a complete account of consciousness. I think we're always going to need a, a multitude of approaches. 
Uh, further, that you know, even if you put all these different approaches together, you're still not going to have anything like a complete and consistent account. Now, this is not taking a, a Mysterian position like Colin McGinn would, so I'm not saying that there isn't a great deal more that we can understand about the nature of our cognition and about the nature of our consciousness, um, but it is saying that there are certain limits um, in particular in terms of coming up with anything like a full and final answer to the, the problem of consciousness. Uh, furthermore, I think it's a mistaken assumption to describe cognition of pretty much any kind, conscious or otherwise, in terms of inputs and outputs, the so-called sense, motivate, plan, act, or SMPA model, except with respect to certain very narrow applications where perhaps it is indeed useful. In company with that, I think it's a mistake to apply a linear as opposed to a circular model of causality. So there's an idea in an act of philosophy that cognition isn't in the head and it's not in the environment. Cognition arises out of the interaction of agent with environment, such that subjective experience and objective world cannot be strictly separated. There inextricably intertwined with each other. Um, and this idea that consciousness is taking place at any one or another place in the brain, likewise, uh, I think uh, when that does come up, it's a mistake. Zeki, of course, has his theory of micro-consciousnesses where there are various little centers of the brain, each of which is a micro-consciousness of its own, and he suggests that all that are our global consciousnesses is a collection of these micro-consciousnesses, but with due respect to, to Zeki and, and people uh, with similar theoretical approaches, um, you know, it's one of my few points of agreement with Dennett. There is not one physical place in the brain, uh, probably, where consciousness all comes together. Uh, now, there is something that I call perspectival dualism, which is going to be very relevant um, for this talk today. Uh, it's uh, an updated form of the metaphysical position known as neutral monism as opposed to physical monism. But whereas neutral monism often is implicit about any commitment to an anti-realist metaphysics, I want to make that commitment explicit. Uh, and by an anti-realist metaphysics, I mean one uh, according to which all we can say for certain about the nature of the mind-independent world is, first of all, that it's there, and secondly, that it's constraining all of our experiencings. But everything that we say about the world after that, we're saying about the experienced world rather than the mind-independent world. Perspectival dualism, furthermore, prior prioritizes epistemology over ontology. It's interested in what we know and how we know it more than worrying about what actually is or isn't the case. Representations are confined to a relatively peripheral role. The, the main claim being made by perspectival dualism is that mental and physical are neither two ontologically separate substances, as substance dualism in its various flavors would claim, neither are they two ontologically distinct sets of properties. Rather, what we call mental and what we call physical reflect competing, complementary, yet ultimately irreconcilable perspectives on one and the same world, perspectives that we shift effortlessly and for the most part unselfconsciously between to the extent that they seem to blur for us into one single perspective. And that, I think, is the root of the supposed explanatory gap and the mind-body problem. Now, the one perspective, call it the mental perspective, if you will, places the observer front and center. The other perspective, call it the physical one, that one banishes the observer or seemingly removes the observer from the equation altogether. Depending on where one's attention is, either perspective may validly appear as the primary perspective, the other one as secondary and derivative. But if this is right, then science in general is fundamentally erring if it thinks that it is or it even can be truly, strictly objective. That is, that it proceeds by entirely removing the observer and her effects from the observation. Rather, science is always part of a historical and a cultural context with which it is inextricably intertwined 
which helps to shape it. Now, there is this idea of the phenomenal unity of consciousness, which it relates to the, the binding and the unbinding problem that I'll be talking about in the rest of the talk. This phenomenal unity of consciousness is often taken to be one of the defining characteristics of consciousness, along with such other aspects as directed attention, awareness, categorization, that's where concepts come in, aboutness, and so on. On the one hand, the phenomenal unity of consciousness may seem to be so basic as to appear, at least to some people, as something that we are conceptually obligated to assume. That is more explanons than explanandum, something we use to build explanations with rather than something to be explained. On the other hand, and for people like Barry Dainton, who, whom I'll be going on to talk about in a moment, if all phenomena allow a physical description, assuming that we understand just what we mean by physical description, of course, and if this is a genuine phenomenon, and I think phenomenal unity of consciousness is, it's unclear why this phenomenon should be different from any other physical phenomenon. Now, I make a qualification about physical uh, descriptions and physical explanations because, you know, to take a point from Thomas Nagel, it's not clear that we have a really clear idea of exactly what physical stuff is, let alone what it means to offer a physical explanation. In any case, presuming that this phenomenal unity of consciousness is real, it does raise serious issues about how it should be understood and how, in terms of brain and body processes, it comes about. Now, a quote here from Barry Dainton. Uh, he writes, you are, let us suppose, studying a landscape painting hung on a museum wall. While so doing, you are absent-mindedly playing with a pen, exploring its shape with your fingers, and over to your right, you hear a murmured conversation. The painting, as it features in your consciousness, is a complex of many parts, all of which are unified in a distinctive way. You see the depicted tree-covered mountains, the bubbling brook, the frame and surrounding wall. The same applies to your experiences of the pen and the conversation. These two are unified complexes, albeit in different sensory modalities. Now, there is a lot of discussion in parts of the philosophical literature. Dainton brings this up, whether there are genuine cases of phenomenal disunity of consciousness. But those alleged cases aside, it's unclear, at least to this researcher, whether anyone actually experiences their own con uh, consciousness as any kind of disunity, at least at the moment of experiencing. I'd like to leave open the possibility of some kind of disunity over time. Indeed, I think most people's experience of their own consciousness, of their own identity, is both unified and disunified over time. But in the moment of experiencing, it is perhaps only unified. So, yes, over time, I think there's a simultaneous unity and disunity. We feel like we both are the same person and we are someone different from when we were younger or when we were children. Now, certain mental disorders are meant to offer exam uh, examples of phenomenal disunity, what used to be known as multiple personality disorder, now more commonly known as dissociative identity disorder, is often held up as an example here. But it's really difficult to interpret exactly what these cases mean for the patient herself. Not least because when people are having something like an acute psychotic episode, it's very difficult generally for them to articulate exactly what it is they're experiencing. Split brain patients are sometimes held up as examples of phenomenal disunity as well, but these are even more difficult, I think, to interpret as evidence for such disunity, not least because the instances in which the alleged disunity appears are very much controlled laboratory-type experiments, uh, behaviorally and in every other way that people can think of. Uh, split brain patients are pretty much like anybody else uh, under ordinary circumstances in terms of their day-to-day -day lives. It's in controlled circumstances where behavioral differences appear, and even then it's very unclear at the least whether the patients themselves experience any kind of phenomenal disunity. Now, this is the picture that I used as the icon, if you will, for my talk today. Uh, and once you see the picture, 
out of the dots, then it's supposed to be difficult, if not indeed impossible, to unsee that picture. Of course, it's a picture of a Dalmatian dog rustling in the leaves. And somehow, all these dots come together to make a unified picture for us. Uh, so the binding problem can be expressed like this. This, again, is from Barry Dainton, uh, who says, the neural processes associated with seeing shape, color, and location occur in different parts of the brain's visual centers. How do these spatially separated neural systems cooperate to produce a unified visual experience? And then, how do these visual experiences, according to Dainton's arguments, how do these come together with simultaneous auditory, olfactory, gustatory, tactile, interoceptive, and propri pro proprioceptive experiences? And how do all these sensory experiences come together with our experience of our own thoughts, if you take those as being perceptual as well, and I think we should? Where do unconscious thoughts come into play? What role are they taking in the coming together of this phenomenal unity of consciousness? Now, if you take this sort of perspective, this sort of approach that Dainton is in trying to explain the phenomenal unity of consciousness in terms of the binding problem, it raises, I think, a number of difficulties. First of all, it preoccupies itself, I think necessarily, with an arguably outdated input-output based model of cognition, one that assumes a linear process from sensory perceptions through to conscious experience, linear causal model. Putting this another way, looking at the phenomenal unity of consciousness just in terms of the binding problem frames this phenomenal unity in terms, strictly in terms of bottom-up processes, from brain to mind to consciousness. And it assumes as well what I would take, what I think other inactive researchers would take, to be a problematic distinction between so-called internal experience and external reality, as opposed to, say, an underlying continuity between agent and environment. It implicitly endorses a reductive approach to consciousness, whereby, at least in principle, consciousness is fully reducible to simpler physical processes. Now, you might want to distinguish, indeed, I do want to distinguish between the coming together of consciousness in terms of its underlying mechanics, which is what I take Dainton really to be addressing, and on the other hand, the seemingly unavoidable reality that all of us experience our conscious experience as unified from the onset. So, Bringing this back to my earlier discussion of perspectival dualism, whether the unity of consciousness, the phenomenal unity of consciousness, is a problem to solve or a conceptually obligatory starting point, whether it's a point one arrives at a destination or a starting point for a journey, depends very much on what questions one is asking and what perspective one is taking. Looking at it only the one way or the other, using only the what I call the mental perspective or the physical perspective will present at best only half a picture and more likely no useful, no meaningful picture at all. So the unbinding problem is this. How does an initially phenomenally unified conscious experience get categorized and otherwise conceptually broken down into the various internal, in scare quotes, and external sensory modalities, thoughts, feelings, and so on? Here again is that close relationship that I want to talk about between conceptual agency and consciousness is two sides of a coin. This idea that I call the unbinding problem finds support in Edmund Husserl's phenomenology, particularly the later Husserl, and Husserl's idea that everything begins from and ultimately comes back to the life world, that is the world as experienced by a conscious living organism. Aaron Gerwich, the phenomenologist, uh, phenomenologist, seems to assume it through most of his writings. Joran Sonnesen, my former colleague at Lund University, writes that basically everything Gerwich has written is about this issue. And indeed, I've only started to read Gerwich. I need to read much more of him. But this quote from a paper of his, A Non-Ecological Conception of Consciousness, gives a flavor of, of how he is talking about the same initial unity of consciousness. Um, and when he's talking about the ego here, he doesn't mean 
ego in the Freudian sense, he means it in any of the senses in which we experience our self, ourselves as a self. So he writes, the unity of consciousness in no way depends upon the ego. Conversely, the latter is rendered possible by the former. The unity of consciousness comes first. So the bottom line here is that the unbinding problem, if, if this approach that I'm taking is more or less on the right track. The unbinding problem is just as important to understanding subjective experience and by extension individual and collective phenomenology as the binding problem is to understanding the underlying mechanics. But you don't want to get the two of them to confuse together. Neither of these problems, neither the binding problem on the one hand nor the unbinding problem on the other can be taken to be more basic, more true to the underlying reality. You need both of them together to get anything as close as we possibly can get to a complete experience of the phenomenal unity of our consciousness. Thank you very much. Excellent, Joel. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that. And I have, uh, and, and I've kept wonderfully to time too. Um, I have a number of questions myself, but I suspect our um, discussant designate um, Fred also has a, a few questions you might like to ask. Yeah, our vast audience. Yes. Those viewers who are also uh, yeah. speaking live or also viewing live, um, as I mentioned earlier, you can ask questions now. Um, through the, the Q&A app. Um, Q&A app is available if, if it's not already active. Um, the, the small apps icon, the, five, the, the four small white boxes on the top right of your viewer there, um, that will give you the apps menu. And the, the Q&A app is a, a blue speech bubble with Q&A in, in white there. So you can, you can type questions to Joel um, if you so wish. So um, thanks again, Joel. Thank you for that. And um, Fred, I'll, I'll give you the first question if you'd like to Jump Thanks in. very much, Joel. That was that was very informative. I know we've we've talked about such issues very often before, and I've been curious about your self-conscious anti-realist stand. Yeah. Um, the the unbinding problem, as you pose it, is I think very well uh, articulated and is very important. And I'm entirely sympathetic to your view that um, we should view this scientific approach to consciousness. I think is if I may re-express it, as dialogical, that is, we're never going to come up with a single final account. We're always going to be bouncing around. We have to, to be able to tell the story in, in multiple ways, and that's simply the nature of... Um, so, so it's a matter of negotiation all the way down, and will will remain so. And, and, and those... Wrong. Yeah, um, those multiple accounts are going to, if I'm right, line up more or less on one side or the other of these two competing perspectives that I want to talk about. Possibly. The, the, yeah. the, the Vedantic tradition has had various responses to this in the both Vaita and Advaita schools, which are monist and dualist, respectively. But then there's a third, Achinta Veda Aveda, which is um, more like neutral monism, but it's called it's a kind of a dual aspect monism, which suggests that you your language is going to force you to adopt a dualist perspective because the language will come with subjects and objects or subjects and predicates at the very least. Um, but if That's are, like Fodor's predicate uh, dualism. Now, you know, I want to to say that that. Dualism in language is parasitic, if you will, on a essential dualism in the nature of our underlying conceptual thought. Right. Grand. And uh, before I ask my question, one more point of reference is Christine Scarder's work with Walter Freeman. I don't know if you know it. She very much not right off the top of my head. Yeah. She very much discusses your unbinding problem very directly, yep. and then yep. she quit and went off to a Buddhist monastery. So be careful. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess I I have. While I'm, as I said, completely mm -hmm. sympathetic and I like your approach and I think we share m most things, I'm a little bit worried about the strength with which you can claim the unity of consciousness, uh, which is your starting point for the unbinding problem. Um, Phenomenal unity of consciousness. You, yes. Yeah. You asked whether anyone experiences their own consciousness as a disunity. So I'm going to jump in here with my own phenomenological observation and say, yes, I do. I, I have noticed this on many occasions. When you bang Synchronically your head, as opposed to diachronically. Yes. 
Yes, okay. Yeah. Uh, when something very unexpected and traumatic happens, when you are ripped from one flow of sense making, and you have to reassemble the pieces into another, in the event of a car crash or simple, simply a sudden unexpected blow to the head, for example, this can can be as simple as you can ha you can do this experiment in your own kitchen, but you have to be not expecting the blow to the head. <laughs> In fact, that's typically where I do this experiment. And there is a very, if you're sensitive to it, there's a very um, brief period in which you have to sort of almost knowingly reassemble the world and adopt what is now a perspective on a hugely altered set of circumstances, especially if it's been traumatic, like like a, a crash or something. Sure. I, 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 yeah, what I want to do with that, and what I have tried to do with that previously, is to address it in, in a slightly different way and say that in those moments, and, and when we have similar moments when we wake up from a really deep sleep, the, the, there's an initial phase in which everything, uh, there's experience, but there is no obvious conceptual structure to it. Um, so there, there's not uh, a clear sense of different sensory modalities, never mind of different objects and actions that we can neatly categorize out. And those are the moments, I think, when we come closest to experiencing something like truly non-conceptual experience. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's conscious experience without the conceptual framework that we, we usually, as human uh, agents, uh, associate with it, I think. Um, so rather than calling it phenomenologically disunified, um, and you know, maybe I need to think through this uh, some more and, and, and reflect on what you're saying, but rather than seeing it as phenomenologically disunified, I'd rather say that it's the closest we come to conceptually unstructured experience, which is you know, roughly where I think we start out as, as infants before we have any conceptual fr uh, frameworks to guide our experience. And you know, I think most of the time, as uh, you know, certainly as adult human beings, um, experience for us is is always a mix of the conceptual and the non-conceptual. Um, you know, as opposed to someone like Mike Beaton, uh, who would say that experience just is experience to the extent that to which it's conceptually structured. I want to say, well, no, it's always for us a mix of the two. But in those moments, like you describe, those are the moments when it comes the closest to being non-conceptually structured, where the the conceptual structure really fades into the background. Right. You you will. You do, of course, encounter uh, objections when you stand up in a bunch of scientists and adopt an anti-realist point of view. That's necessarily going to be the case. Uh, I've seen this happen. And, and the anti-realist position, it's interesting because it's, it's a very much uncomfortable fence-sitting position. Yes. Um, there's so much pressure to go off one side of the divide or the other. But I, I think it, it's, it's helpful in this regard to uh, recognize the, that this discussion would be a very different discussion if we were having it in 1880 compared to today, and very different discussion, oh, sure. again, if we were having it in the year 1200 compared to today. So the introduction, you called, the, you, you, you called this perspectival dualism. The very introduction of linear perspective and images itself fundamentally changed the way that we discuss the observer and introduced an observer, in many respects, into our talk. The history of psychology is one of fixing an observation point, stopping it moving around and behaving like a real subject and therefore generating an artificial observer. We've had the advent of um, cinematic and audio recordings, which again create this sort of fiction of a, an observer's point, which is distinct from, from what's going on. Um, an absolute divide, yeah. yeah. So, so it's easier in some respects to even become aware of the problems of the language that we're using if we point to these historical developments. And I think something with the community as a whole is lacking here is a retelling of the history of the development of our concepts within, where, in, in the framework within which science itself has arisen because this has all been informed by Christian ideas. Oh yeah, Christian absolutely. Ideas of yeah. Christian ideas of the soul, and I'd like to see the, see us be at least self-conscious about that. And it's not surprising that some of the more perturbing contributions come from these Buddhist strands yeah. <laughs> that don't share those commitments. I'd be, no, no, I, I fully agree. Um, and and you know, I've I've talked about that um, 
uh, those vestiges of Christian theological thinking in respect to other areas uh, of consciousness and cognition. So, yeah, yeah. Totally. Mark? I, just to, to jump in, that I, I'd be um, remiss if I didn't point out that Ed Reed has such a history in yeah. his book From Soul to Mind. Um, so I'm reading and it's great. Thanks for putting me on to it. finishes with William James, but it, um, beginning with uh, Thomas Reed and others in the, the sort of the, the late late 1700s, early 1800s. There's much more we could add. He's not. It's not comprehensive enough. No. There's much more. He doesn't also know. He doesn't know the Eastern stuff, um, and he doesn't look at the role of these technologies. He looks very much at the social currents, but not the technologies. Um, it is, but in in terms of providing that um, cultural and religious context to the development of psychological science, um, it's a as as clear a statement. But also um, is a sort of an interestingly way, an interesting way in which you can dramatically, um, re, you know, reperceive psychology. Um, in, a, in a manner that sort of uh, is um, uh, eye-opening, at the very least. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Joel, if I might ask uh, um, just a much narrower question, actually. And sure. More, more specific. Um, and it specifically um, ref concerns the, the sort of two um, dual complements or dualisms that you mentioned. Um, the, the two perspectives um, in the perspective of evil dualism, and mental and physical, but also this um, the complementary pair of the binding problem and the unbinding problem. Mm -hmm. And just thinking about it um, sort of briefly and informally, the, I, I would expect there to be an easy relationship between um, those two complementary pairs. That, the, you know, the maybe the unbinding is the mental and the binding is the physical, that, that these are approaches that are associated with different aspects of the, the, um, the perspectival. But I can't quite see how that works. I'm not sure if, if the, the two um, dualisms do line up in that kind of way and whether you could colonize their relationship in some way and have you know, the, the mental perspective with the unbinding problem and, and various other mentalistic aspects down one column um, and the physical with the binding problem um, in the in the group there uh, and other physical aspects, and if that's the if that's the case, or first of all, I suppose the the direct question is, do you think they do line up in such a way? Is there an easy relationship between those um, the different elements of those complementary pairs? And um, if not, do you think the fact that they don't tells us something interesting? I think they do line up neatly to this extent, which is that the way that people like Barry Dainton are trying to use the binding problem to explain specifically the phenomenal unity of consciousness lines up very neatly with what I'm calling the physical perspective. And the antidote to that in terms of the posing of the unbinding problem uh, to explain that phenomenal unity lines up um, then quite well with what I'm calling the mental approach. But I think, and you know, I really need to do some uh, more reflection on how this would work, but I really think um, both of these apply, um, uh, both perspectives apply to both problems. Um, and it's just that, um, you know, it, it, because Dainton is focusing um, so specifically on trying to explain this phenomenology, this phenomenal, phenomenological unity, mm -hmm. um, that uh, it lines up as well as it appears to in my presentation. But absolutely, there, there should be a way that both perspectives should apply to both problems. Okay, do, and do does either problem can you can you make either problem dissolve? I mean, it it would be the likes of I mean, Dennett sort of quasi goes there. Susan Hurley gets the issue a little bit as well, which the binding problem is in essence a poorly phrased problem that it only comes up because of assumptions you make about the manner in which um, consciousness um, operates in the first place. Well, the, there is, um, you know, uh, there are important questions to be asked, however you, you label them, in terms of how um, all the different mechanics underlying, um, all the underlying mechanics um, of the, the brain and the mind and the conscious mind um, are able to make possible in combination with the, the body as a whole, with the environment, the interactions with the environment, all these things uh, that you know, we ascribe to, to consciousness, including its uh, phenomenal unity. 
Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think it's not wrong to call that the binding problem, um, but that when, you know, when you're looking at consciousness that way, you're really talking about the underlying mechanics um, as opposed to the experienced uh, consciousness. Okay. Does you. that address the... I think it gives me some sense of things all right. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. I, 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 mm -hmm. I'd like to um, caution here. Uh, the way that you've laid things out, Joel, you... A Kantian will come along and say, "Ah, yeah, that's very familiar. That was a noumenal phenomenal distinction that you gave us there. That we access, we've access to the phenomena, and you, the, the noumenal world is not knowable." Um, but all that seems to rely, I think, on very well worn but ultimately indefensible interpretations of what the word "physical" means. I find these days when I'm talking to physicists about any of this stuff. They are very happy with the idea that physicists don't know what they're talking about. Um, that the idea of what physics is is not at all clear, and they don't see it as the high road to reality. Physics has got too fucking weird for that, to be quite honest with you. Rather, going back to sort of the views of someone like Sir Arthur Eddington, physics is the craft of measurement, and it's a spectacularly good craft of measurement, but all physical measurements must ultimately make a, a perceivable, perceptible, experiential difference. There must be a, a thing that wags, a something we can see, touch, read, hear, feel to it, otherwise we won't accept it as a measurement. And I think the recent gravitational wave detection, where the actual change is less than the thousand of the diameter of a proton, but we build these big detector detectors as a magnifying glass to make it yeah. phenomenal so that we can actually see it. And then we see it on our screens and it's beautiful. So um, I don't, I, I caution against Mark's sort of Alignment there that the physical a physicalist view is the bottom up one and the mentalist view. Well, is no, the no, no. I don't. I, I don't want to use the terms physicalist and mentalist um, because of all the the baggage that those yeah. drag in. Thing, I think the words physical and mental bring that baggage with them. The ist isn't the problem. It's the physical. Yeah. And the okay. Um, yeah. I mean, the point well taken. And the I primary and secondary qualities that. and everything. Yeah, I, I even you know made passing reference to that um, because Nagel talks about this and what it's like to be a bat. He says we don't really understand what physical is except in a very rough and ready sense, and you know physical explanations even less so. Um, and and I think um, quantum mechanics, as as you were gesturing toward there, it gives excellent supporting arguments for this by saying, well, you know, uh, the observer is necessarily um, uh, part of and changing the observation in, in a way that you can't extract out. So um, uh, we, we, we understand what physical stuff is and what physical explanations are in a rough and ready way with respect to our day-to-day -day existence, but as soon as we start trying to unpick it too much, and this is really, you know, the the point that I I um, see as being at the heart of of neutral monism um, or you know perspectival dualism, namely that what we think of as mental and what we think of as physical, um, you know, th th there's one world um, that's. Um, in in some important sense, a unified um, world, but it's it's got aspects of both. You know, it's both mental and physical, and neither at the same time. Um, and the problem is that we can't step outside of the world that we're experiencing in order to get some sort of objective view of it from the outside. We just sort of make this nice pretense that we can that we do and you know it's it's much of this pretense that is necessary for pushing forward the the science of consciousness but you know at the same time or pushing forward the science of anything because you know as I was saying science is always done within a particular historical and cultural context we we think that just because um, you know an intersubjective um, perspective uh, pulls us away from a, a narrowly uh, subjective individual subjective experience um, or perspective that this is somehow you know closer to being strictly objective and well you know intersubjective uh, bias can be as bad or worse than than individual subjective bias. So yeah, uh, absolutely. There's um, yeah, I don't know how best to get this across, but uh, um, you know there is a real there, there's a real problem with the 
the, the language, and the language is reflecting a real problem with the limitations of um, our perception and the limitations of our conceptual thought. Two, two, two nice examples I, li I like to adduce and feel free to pass them on. Yeah. Uh, one is Dr. Johnson kicking the stone and to refute Bishop Barclay, and the other is doubting Thomas sticking his finger in Jesus' side. They both want physical proof. To, physical dis one, one is stating the physically obvious by kicking the stone, and the other is wanting physical proof, and it's 100% experiential. It involves wetness, warmth, touching, seeing, feeling, and sensory motor engagement in Dr. Johnson's case. They couldn't be more experiential. Those two paradigms of physicality couldn't be more mental. Well, Barclay's position, it's really weird, and um, you know, I really should dive into it more sometime, because he's got he, he says, uh, basically, oh, my position is really as realist and physicalist as anybody else. It's just what I mean by that is that everything exists as a thought in the mind of God. Um, this being that is basically dreaming, thinking, all of this, including the stone, including the effects of the stone, into experience. So um, Barclay's world is very different from what many people have in mind by an idealist metaphysics, e even as I think it is that's, very wrong or true, very misguided. Your, your insistence that there's one world is very close then from Barclay's view to simply being a monotheist. I don't know if you've ever been called a monotheist in public before. <laughs> no, I haven't. Um, I, I don't think that there's any one um, correct way of characterizing um, the world. Um, there's an idea that I, I borrow freely from Etzel Cardenia, who's um, a professor of parapsychology, actually, at the University of Lund. Um, but uh, he raised this in a talk that he gave for the Center for Cognitive Semiotics. He's, he's raised it in papers, this idea that, um, uh, and you know, this is quite separate from his research on parapsychology, that what we may have in the case of many altered states of consciousness, um, when, whether they're drug-induced or induced by something like a sensory deprivation tank or, or whatever, um, is the temporary replacement of one conceptual framework by another equally valid framework. And it's just that we get so bound into one way of structuring our world for ourselves. It's like painting ourselves progressively into a corner. Evans Pritchard, the anthropologist, had this nice report when he came back from his field work in, in Ethiopia, uh, where he said that, when I'm here, I'm among you, and I, we share our concepts, and we talk in one way. When I'm with them, those ghosts are bleeding real, those spirits are real, and, and I believe what they believe. And rather than being pathological, I think that's a highly skillful way of being, <laughs> the skill of a good anthropologist. Well, even e even more basic than that, I think, um, uh, and I was actually talking about this in one of my talks at AISB, um, I think that there's something fundamentally misguided about our Western notion of personhood, and in particular this idea of strictly private experience, like we're little islands, totally caught off from one another. It's, it's and, and I think, yeah, I, I think that we are substantially defined by and helping to define the people around us. So that you, you change the, the physical and social context, you change the person. I am a different person in this social context than I was at the University of Sussex social context than I was in Washington, D.C., and so on. Because Were there a framework within which erotic experience could be discussed freely? I think you know, I take my tip from the symposium you were just at. That, I think, would change things radically because that's, that's the little kettle, the little place at which the individuality of experience become, falls apart completely. Yeah. And, and, you know, in terms of mental health issues, um, one of the things that um, framing everything in reductionist terms gets wrong, besides um, having a way oversimplified causal story and ignoring the environment and ignoring the history of the patient, um, is that what we call mental illness typically does not observe nice, neat physical boundaries in the way that physical illnesses by and large, if not almost universally, do so. If I have um, uh, if if I have uh, a problem with my liver producing uh, 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 producing insulin, 
um, that's a problem with my liver. Now, you know, environmental factors may very likely contribute to that, um, um, but ultimately, you know, it, 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 and it can be treated in isolation, largely in isolation, from consideration of my environment. But when it comes to mental health issues, they don't respect that at all. And why don't they respect that? Because um, when we draw the lines between ourselves and other people as, as cognitive entities, as opposed to biological uh, ones, um, we do so in a very flexible and negotiable manner. Uh, Andy Clark has this wonderful line from Chapter 2 of Supersizing the Mind, where he talks about profoundly embodied agents who are able continually to negotiate and renegotiate the agent world boundary. And, and I think that's so dead on. Um, but it's, it's why I think you know, mental health issues are problems of the community as much as they're problems of the individual and they're problems of interaction as much as they have anything to do with the, the brain and body chemistry of individual persons. And the border between them and somatic problems is, is, is itself completely poorly defined. Yeah. Um, the, the Foucault's work on the, on the the specialization of the of the medical profession, the somatic doctors, yeah, with, with that he lays it out quite well. That that itself was a power grab. It's an assertion of authority over specific domains. Yeah, and with that you introduce this this artificial divide between um, the realm of the body and the realm of, for example, social relations. When I worked in early eighties in Germany on a psychosomatic ward. We weren't quite sure what psychosomatic meant. It meant something where the mind and the body were involved. And so we started off with anorexics because they clearly died even though it was a mental problem, right? Yeah. Then we got into asthmatics because they clearly had a, a psychological profile. And then we got into heart patients because they all had psychological profiles. When did we start? Then we gave up <laughs> because, because the whole of medicine just exploded. The psychosomatic thing, it was a good starting point, but as, as the idea caught on and became successful, it killed itself by being by being too successful and revealing these the shoddiness of those boundaries. Yeah. Excellent. Unfortunately, um, I'm going to have to impose a boundary. Um, and uh, shoddy, that... shoddy. <laughs> well, I, as with all boundaries, this will be porous. The discussion can continue on EnsoSeminars.com, and I invite um, both um, uh, Joel and Fred and um, those who are watching. Um, watching either live or uh, watching the, the YouTube recording. To silent lurkers in the background. There, the internet is chock full of such silent lurkers. Um, the of the top China. <laughs> they are all invited to give voice to their lurkers. I, I'm actually going to go. That I, I don't have any more time. But thanks, Joel. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and Mark, this has worked brilliantly. Um, I've been really impressed with, with how this has, has it's worked. Getting it's getting really cool. It deserves yeah. a bigger audience, but it's, a, it's, yeah. it's becoming the format of choice. In time, I hope. Um, we we'll certainly hope it will grow. Now, um, just before you go, Fred, I might as well point out that you will, in fact, be giving the 8th so Seminar, unless I'm mistaken. Um, this will be at something of a non-standard um, time and date but we will confirm that um, closer to the, the actual scheduled event itself. Um, and I'm obviously very looking forward to that. We're going to have to bring in a few other discussants, though. Thursday the 19th at 2 p.m. So, so, that's, so I think it's the usual time. That's Irish time, too. Um, it's Irish time, 2 p.m. It'll be 1, uh, 1 p.m. UTC. So that's um, where you... What's we, what's the, oh, UTC is, is our winter time, yeah. Yeah, yeah Zulu time. Yeah. Um, U.S. Navy time. Yeah. On Thursday the 19th, yeah. Thursday the 19th of May, so... Um, so, Joel, thank you very much for uh, an interesting and stimulating talk, and thank you, uh, thank you both and to um, and to, to the viewers as well for for participating. Uh, and hopefully, we'll we'll see you all for the eighth seminar. Yeah. Um, and EnselSeminars.com, the the discussion continues there, or um, can do at least. Excellent. Thank you. See you now.